Good evening and welcome to the RLA's 20th birthday party celebrations. A party uh, to celebrate our new look and our new branding and an opportunity to say thank you to you, our members and supporters. The RLA has been around for 20 years providing advice and support to landlords, campaigning on your behalf in Parliament and at local councils and working hard to ensure your voice is heard in the sector. 20 years is a long time. We are uh, the UK's oldest national landlord association and beside me is Andrew Goodacre, our chief executive, who's going to tell us a little bit about how it all started. Good evening everyone. Uh, yes, I've been given the task of talking about the history of the RLA. Uh, 1998 was a big year in many ways. There was a Winter Olympics, there was a World Cup. Uh, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky were all over the headlines for the wrong reasons. Um, and most notably, the, the Good Friday Agreement, um, you know, 20 years ago as well. For the RLA, it was a significant year because it was our formation, the beginning of what is now uh, the fastest growing association in the country. Um, the catalyst for, for it all actually started in 1997, when a few landlords got together, I'm told in a smoky pub in Manchester, uh, to launch a campaign against uh, government intervention in the sector. 20 years on, nothing much has changed from that point of view. But the campaign was successful, and what it did inspire people to realise was that there, there could be so much more achieved if people pulled together in the same direction. So the, at the time in 1998, we had the Manchester Landlord Association, and we had the North West Landlords Association, as two small separate bodies coming together and out of that formed the Residential Landlord Association. It was a, a brave decision then in 98 to launch an internet based company. Um, at the time in 98 I'm not sure people really knew what the internet was and certainly didn't understand, fully understand the full potentials of it and what we see now. But the RLA was formed as an internet based business uh, with um, a website and people to join online. A brave decision, a bold decision, a visionary decision um, that has stood the test of time because now where would we be without the internet? And arguably, we would like to say to many landlords, where would you be without the RLA and, and uh, representing you in the sector? A lot has changed in these 20 years, a lot has changed in the sector, and those changes invariably have had an impact on what we do as a business to further support and help our, our members and landlords in general. The business is based in sale and the state in sale in that time, but the offices have got larger um, just to, to, to cover the more staff that we need. The staff have grown. When I joined in 2013, I was number 14, and we're now up to 32 uh, capable, quality, committed people who want to make a positive difference for landlords and, and for the sector in general. The biggest growth has been, in terms of people, has been in the advice team. The landlord advice team started off with one person. Um, in fact, when I joined, I think it was three, three people, uh, one full-time and two part-time, dealing with 2,000 calls a month. We're now up to 11 people and we take 50,000 calls, emails and live chats a year dealing with the many problems that landlords face in the sector. Um, a quality team who really deliver um, at the sharp end and help landlords where it's most needed. We've seen um, growth in membership. I said earlier um, that uh, when it formed out of the two small associations, it started with 350 members officially. We're now up to nearly 40, 34,000 members and uh, that continues to grow and we've seen significant growth this year already. It's, it, it's probably evidence, hopefully, that we are doing the right thing, but it's also further evidence that landlords need help in this uh, ever-regulated, ever-changing sector. We continue to see investment um, in technology. We've introduced live chat, which I mentioned as, as LAT, and looking ahead, we'll continue to invest in, in an improved phone system, an improved website, and improvements in providing the, best, the services that we think that meet the needs of landlords in general. We are growing, we are evolutionary, we continue to, to strive to meet the needs of, of landlords and really try to make a real positive difference for them. We listen, we understand, we offer expert advice, but more than anything else, we go the extra mile to make, to make um, the life easier for landlords and helping landlords, um, helping you meet your ambitions. So we've moved on 20 years, 2018, and we had a logo when we started that, that has served us very well 
But in reality, we realised that if we wanted to continue and wanted to con continue to, to develop as an organisation, we needed to reshape and realign our identity. And that was a big decision that we took last year and we launched our new identity just a couple of weeks ago, which hopefully you've all seen and heard about. Uh, to explain more about that, it's probably best if I hand over to our brand executive, Matthew Davis Lombardi, who is the, the, the person who's helped us bring it all together. Matthew. Hello. So, with the new logo, we want it to be more visible and easier to recognise. We wanted it to work across all platforms. You might experience your life from anything on a smartwatch to a billboard now. We wanted to be bolder and more confident, and we wanted a logo that reflected the respected influential position we've come to find ourselves in 20 years later. We think it's important to have a flag that our members are happy to stand under, and we think we've achieved that. And with what we've introduced, we've got something future-proof that will extend better and evolve more coherently over time as we introduce new features, functions and services. Just a quick question, what convinced you that we needed to change? What was it that really, what was the catalyst that said that the, we needed this new identity? Well, I mean, the thing is, we've got amazing social media followings. We've got um, 22,000 landlords on Twitter, 4,000 on Facebook, and we were almost not recognisable on those platforms because we had a logo that was you know, designed before those platforms existed. And now we've got something that is instantly recognisable, a very clear, concise, confident brand that any member can take and use as well now with our packages. We, you can put a, an RA logo on your website and it's always going to be obvious what it is. And even the house icon, yes, that can be our icon going forwards. It's something instantly recognisable that sums up the RLA in just a glance. Fantastic. And what sort of feedback have you had so far? It's been incredibly positive, actually, yeah. Um, haven't haven't had any negative complaints yet, and that's kind of risky to say now. Well, <laughs> yes, we're, by all means, give us your feedback and let us know what you think. But uh, the comments I've seen have, have indicated we've achieved what we wanted to achieve, which was a contemporary, forward-looking, um, stable business, and that's what we are, and that's what we, we intend to be for the next 20 years and more. Absolutely, and we, we didn't want to lose sight of what our brand had meant to members all along as well, so I hope they see something that reflects of what they knew and love about the old identity of the RLA. Okay, lovely. Well, that's the history of the RLA to, from 98 to today. We've heard from Matt um, talking about why and how we came about this new look logo. At the end of the day, no matter how we look and how we um, represent ourselves from a marketing point of view and a business point of view, we're always going to be an organisation that wants to campaign and make a difference uh, for our landlords in the private rented sector. And at this point, I think it's right if, we, if I introduce now both John Stewart, our policy manager, and Carrie Curse, one of our directors, to talk about those issues in, in the private rented sector. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew and Matthew. And as if by magic, we have uh, Carrie Coos. Carrie is one of our directors. She's a landlord and letting agent based in Sheffield. And uh, she may be familiar to a lot of you if you've attended any of our training courses. Carrie is, of course, one of our, our key trainers and uh, travels all around the country ensuring that you're up to date with the, the information that you need to run a, a successful uh, property business and ensure that your homes are safe, legal and secure. Carrie? Well, it's been a very busy few years in terms of policy, hasn't mm -hmm. it, John, and the changing in regulation. So yes, it certainly kept us more than busy in the training department. And it's been really great to be able to get out there, up and down the country, meeting fellow landlords, fellow letting agents, and really being able to pass on the information that's so key to your businesses at the moment. Um, John, some of the things that's been cropping up quite a lot for me in terms of questions is around fire safety. Hot topic at the moment. It is, yeah. Um, fire safety is quite a complex area. Um, it really depends on the type of property you own, whether there are common parts in that property, 
Um, there, there are three main pieces of legislation that, that cover fire safety, and we do have a lot more information on our website. Of course, it's all come into sharp focus uh, following the, the Grenfell Tower mm -hmm. tragedy. Um, we currently have a review of fire safety going on under Dame Judith Hackett, and of course, we await the outcome of the Grenfell inquiry of Sir Martin Moore Vic. So, um, at the moment, we do have relevant information on our website that, that will keep you on the right side of, of the law as it stands at the moment. But of course, um, it's one of the areas where we are expecting some change, particularly with regard to, to high-rise blocks. Yeah, and certainly what I'm finding at the moment when I'm out there meeting other landlords and letting agents during our training events is that landlords are really starting to ask themselves now, are they actually doing enough for their tenants in terms of fire safety? Yes, there are quite a lot of regulations already out there. Um, the baseline requirement, for example, to provide smoke alarms on every habitable floor and CO detectors in, in rooms with solid fuel. But we still need to ask ourselves, is it enough? Grenfell was a shock. And um, yeah, I, th I think we're all sort of looking at how we can up our game uh, to ensure the safety of both our tenants uh, and ultimately also to protect our properties. And it's not the, the only area we can expect change in um, over the, the next week. While we have a, a draft tenant fees bill at the moment before Parliament that's uh, looking to uh, ban the charging of, of upfront fees to tenants and also uh, the banning of uh, fees charged by third parties as well, if that's uh, an essential part of securing the let of the property. How do you think that's going to impact on landlords and agents, Carrie? Well, I think first of all, we need to point out that the tenants fees ban does apply to landlords. It's not just letting agents who will be banned from charging tenants fees, but landlords as well. And as we know, many self-managing landlords still choose to carry out for referencing checks, as, you know, as we recommend. Um, and there is a cost that's incurred as part of that, as part of the credit referencing process, but that's not a cost that we will be able to pass on to tenants anymore. Um, the other couple of changes that's come in with the tenants fees ban that oh well set to come in with the tenants fees ban should i say uh, is the fact that we will be limited to only being able to take six weeks worth uh, in terms of the security deposit uh, and also any holding deposits will be capped at one week so that's proven to be a little bit tricky for landlords who are quite often holding properties for maybe two three sometimes even four weeks so to only be able to take that financial commitment of one week, it means that we're going to see we're having to enter into contracts far faster. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting times moving forward on that front. Yeah, and the capping of security uh, deposits as well is potentially an issue that might well uh, restrict who landlords are willing to let to um, deposits are quite often used to mitigate risk. Um, pets, pets or, or yeah. uh, tenants claiming uh, benefits where the, mm. the rental income might be um, uncertain. We've seen a lot of changes uh, in, in the welfare regime, particularly around about uh, universal credit, for example. Um, are, are you seeing landlords uh, more reluctant now to, to let to tenants as universal credit rolls out? In short, yes. I think there is a nervousness around the rollout of universal credit and how it's going to be impacting on landlords. Um, obviously, it's still in a phased rollout at the moment. It's still with uh, single claimants. I think, do we know yet when it's going to be coming out into to, to family claimants? It's already started in some areas. Again, like yeah. the initial rollout, it's going to be staggered. And the, the government does publish information of what service is available at um, what uh, job centre pluses. Um, so it is worthwhile checking the, the Department of Work and Pensions website to see where your local uh, mm -hmm. Job Centre Plus is that in terms of the rollout, whether it's full service, live service, whether it's uh, only applied to simple lets, or whether it's ex extended to more complicated cases. And of course, we saw some changes introduced in the last budget, which the, the RLA did welcome, um, that has cut some of that risk. For example, the waiting time has been mm -hmm. cut. We're going to see uh, tenants transferring onto universal credit get uh, two weeks additional uh, housing allowance paid as they transition, uh, which will also help them to, to meet the, the rent commitments up front. So we have had some success and we are working closely with the Department of Work and Pensions to particularly improve the processes, but we also need to see some political change around about universal credit. Some of the big sticking points are um, the fact that direct payment uh, can often be difficult to achieve for landlords. The default position is that rents are still paid to tenants uh, directly, 
and they are then supposed to pay the landlords. But we, we're finding it that the process of securing a, a, an alternative payment arrangement to pay the landlord direct uh, quite complex uh, and difficult still, even where um, there are uh, long-term arrears or a chaotic lifestyle, those decisions are still taking too long to come through. And then there's the issue of arrears themselves. Um, unlike social housing, where a private tenant falls into arrears and moves out the property, um, the, the, the landlord who's left with those arrears has to pursue that tenant privately. There's no automatic uh, deduction uh, from the benefit to pay off those arrears and that's a big disincentive and another big risk that private sector landlords have to take but social uh, sector landlords don't. Yeah it's definitely worth mentioning you know if, if you are a landlord who are you specialising in housing benefits um, we do have some fantastic training offered um, by one of our specialists Bill Irvine tremendous trainer and a tremendous course so well worth thinking about if you're actually specialising in that area um, another change, John, that we can see coming soon is the change to the mandatory HMO licensing. Yeah, there's a huge uh, change that's coming in. Uh, at the moment, um, you must have an HMO license if you have a property with five sharers um, in two or more households and the property is three or more storeys high. But the government from October are going to remove the three storeys requirement. So it will simply be any property with five or more sharers in two or more households. And, and that uh, is, is going to see uh, something between 150,000 and a quarter of a million uh, new homes brought into the mandatory licensing regime. And rather disappointingly, um, in their consultation response, the government promised a transition period, but now they've published the detail of the legislation, that six month grace period or transition period has disappeared. So literally in the space of two months, the government have changed their minds uh, and made things more difficult for landlords who are going to be caught by the new mandatory licensing regime. As if it, the, the extension of mandatory licensing wasn't bad enough, actually we're also going to see regulations imposing a new minimum uh, bedroom size on all um, licensed state channels, so additional and mandatory licensed properties. Yeah, a lot coming up ahead. And, and there's legislation that's in place just now that's slowly being implemented as well. We're seeing the, the rollout of the Housing and Planning Act. Um, local authorities can now uh, issue fines to landlords without the need to go to court as an alternative to prosecution. Those can be up to £30,000 for, for breaches of legislation. We've extended rent repayment orders to, to cover a number of different areas. Uh, we are, um, at the moment, a local authority has to bring in uh, an enforcement policy before it can implement the, the civil penalty regime. Um, we're currently uh, looking over some of those enforcement policies at, at local level just to ensure that they're, they're fair and proportionate. What we don't want to see is local authorities using fines as a default position and not giving landlords the opportunity to rectify a situation through imposing those fines. And are we seeing much of a discrepancy across those policies for different local authorities? We are beginning to. Um, so some local authorities have been quite good and actually consulting on the policy, so we're getting a, an early chance to see uh, those policies uh, and look at them. But, but some are going in quite heavy-handed. Um, there's a, a consultation that's closed recently in the West Midlands where um, the, the fines are starting at £5,000, which is a big leap from what we've seen from the courts. Um, a, a big issue has been the failure of the courts to, to issue fines that are a real deterrent to landlords, but we're now going to have this ridiculous situation where potentially in some local authority areas, a civil penalty could actually be more than they would likely to be fined if they'd actually been prosecuted and gone to court. Yeah, it's a bit of a frightening prospect when you think that it could be multiple penalties as well for multiple different Breaches, breaches yeah. and it can build and build and build. Yeah, mm. and the other thing we don't want to see is those very serious breaches being dealt with through a succession of civil penalties where uh, landlords are letting dangerous substandard properties, those landlords should be getting prosecuted, should be finding their way to another piece of new legislation we're going to see, which is banning orders. Um, so there, there will be a, a route for local authorities to ban uh, landlords and agents who uh, have breached housing legislation in a consistent fashion and they can be banned from um, undertaking any property management activity. So that really is, is another uh, big stick for councils to be able to use uh, for when pursuing the real criminal landlords in the sector. But what we don't want to see 
is landlords who are doing their best um, and getting hit uh, disproportionately for what are either minor breaches, breaches caused potentially by ignorance or just time scale issues. We, you know, we, landlords do need to be treated fairly. They should be given a chance to put right uh, issues and problems. They should be uh, notified before the, of an issue before a council decides to take action. Quite right. For the sake of our viewers this evening, um, do we have any timescales on when banning orders might be coming in? Yeah, we're expecting to see banning orders from April this year. Um, the extension of mandatory licensing from October this year. Yep. Uh, civil penalties are already with us. Um, the agent fee ban, we think, is likely to be sometime in 2019. And of course, now the government's looking at uh, things like redress, electrical safety checks, the standards. So, yeah, there's, there's a huge amount of change out there. It's very piecemeal, it's very itty bitty. There doesn't seem to be a, a, an overall view. And you can see that from the, the different departments that are bringing forward legislation. So, we're not just dealing with the Ministry of Housing, uh, we're dealing with the Home Office for Right to Rent checks, we're dealing with business. Um, an industrial strategy for the minimum energy efficiency uh, standards which come in in April this year. Um, so uh, we're obviously dealing with Treasury when it comes to issues of taxation uh, and DWP when it comes to, to issues of universal credit. So if, if we were just dealing with one department and there was that sensible strategic overview of life, mm. it would be a little bit easier. No doubt we'd still be seeing a lot of legislation but um, it really is coming at people from all sides and that's before we even touch on Wales um, where you know you, you have a whole devolved government, housing is fully devolved in Wales, they already have um, mandatory registration for, for landlords, you have licensing for agents and self-managing landlords and we're seeing the Renting Homes Act being implemented as well. Okay, do we have any questions yeah. Victoria? <coughs> Right, so I've just been looking at our social and if you've got um, a question that you want to submit to us then you can just tweet us at RLA underscore news or message us on Facebook. So quite a lot of questions around what's been discussed just now. So um, firstly, how can people find out when universal credit will be rolled out in their area? You touched on that, didn't you, John? Yeah, it's... Uh, what. Uh Universal credit is now available at every job centre in the UK, but um, for uh, the less complex cases. Um, the full and live services, the full rollout, the Department of Work and Pensions does maintain a list on its website of, of what service is available at what job centre plus. But do remember, of course, it's a job centre plus of where your property and your tenant is, not your home job centre plus. Right. And um, the RLA has done quite a lot of campaigning around universal credit things like the quarterly surveys. Tell us more about some of our key achievements. Uh, as I say, we, we've been working hard on, on universal credit, um, some of it behind the scenes. There's really two areas that we've worked on. One is the, the processes, um, the way that the, the system actually works and, and trying to ensure that it works the way we've been told it will work. Um, and some of that is about securing standard scripts and better education uh, uh, for work coaches and job centres, plus to ensure there's consistency with claims. Some of it's been about ensuring that, um, that the online system works better. Um, and so th there's been a whole set of process related things where we've had some success and we continue to work with, with DWP staff. Uh, and indeed they are looking for uh, volunteers at the moment to, to road test uh, new portals, new information services for landlords and tenants and universal credit. Then there's the political issues, which are sometimes harder to, to deal with. Um, a key issue has been around the six-week waiting time, which, uh, as mentioned earlier, was a cut in the last budget, and that was a big success. We're seeing more support for uh, tenants who are transitioning from local housing allowance to, to universal credit. But a big issue is still around about information sharing. Um, Landlords can find themselves with a tenant that's worked perfectly well under local housing allowance. They've got a relationship with the local council. They know what's happening to that tenancy. The tenant then transfers to universal credit and that flow of information stops. And suddenly the, the, the direct payment that the landlord had established can also stop. Uh, default uh, is payment 
to the tenant under universal credit. So landlords really left in the dark. And before you know it, you could have two, three, four months of years built up and the landlord doesn't know why. And it's simply because the tenant's been transferred to universal credit. They are now getting the rent money paid direct. No one's told them they're supposed to pay to the landlord. The landlord doesn't know that it's going direct to the tenant. So we're trying to, to work to get the government to agree that the landlord should be entitled to more information about both uh, when tenants transfer to universal credit and about the progress of their claims. And we're also working on things like making that direct payment easier. Yeah. Um, so, Karen, you're a letting agent. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a question from a non-member. What do you think they need to consider if they're looking to become self-managing? Well... <laughs> We've already talked about the uh, the number of changes that we've just recently seen over the last couple of years and the changes that are yet to come. So um, obviously I would be saying straight away, look at joining our organisation. Um, landlords really need to keep on top of legislative changes. It's very, very fast paced um, is housing law. So you need to make sure that you're on the ball. The other thing that I would say is that, you know, we don't plan for disaster. We don't plan for those um, difficult tenants, those, those, those tenants where we have to evict, okay? It doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, it can make our lives, you know, really quite a living hell, let's, let's be frank. It, it can be really tricky. And what we're now seeing is that since the changes to Section 21 rules is that your ability to be able to take back possession of your property is so intrinsically linked to the actions at the beginning of the tenancy. So you really need to get it right at the start of the tenancy to preserve your right to take your property back through the courts, you know, if things don't work out. Um, that will work well. And then um, following on from that, what do you consider um, to be good when, if you're looking for a letting agent? Okay. Um, at the moment, there are, you know, a, a few mandatory obligations on, on letting agents, such as being members of a redress scheme. Um, we are soon going to see letting agents having to hold client money protection. Um, but ultimately, do you know, it just boils down to being able to hand over your property to an agent who you trust. They are going to be looking after your asset for you. Um, you need to ensure that they're going to do a good job for you. And ultimately, I think it's about working with people who you can trust, who you respect. Uh, and I think there's no finer way to find out whether your agent is, is, is a good agent than, than working off referrals, you know. I think landlords forget that even if they hand over the property to be fully managed by an agent, if something goes wrong, if the agent fails to protect a deposit or, or, or some other mm. uh, legislative breach, quite often that comes back on the landlord quite just because right. they've handed it yeah. over to the agent. It, uh, it's not an excuse to not still understand your legislation, no. to know what you should or are supposed to be doing. So even if a property is being fully managed by an agent, it's still important to, to keep up to date with what's going on in the sector, to be a member of, of the RLA and get that information. So if something does go wrong, or you can, uh, you, you can always challenge your agent and ask your agent if, if they're doing the right things. Um, particularly just now when we're seeing so much change, I think mm. landlords need to be in a position if they're taking a property to be managed by an agent to ask, you know, are they going to ensure EPCs are served at the start of the, the tenancy? Are they going to ensure that gas safety certificates are served at the start of the mm. tenancy? Is the deposit going to be protected? All of these things, as you say, that can come back and bite later when a landlord yeah. wants to evict. Quite right, yeah. yeah. Mm. And a final question for the time being, how can people keep up to date with local licensing schemes? Oh my, uh, local licensing <laughs> is, is really is a, a growing industry at the moment from local authorities. Uh, we, we're seeing a huge number of consultations. It can be even very difficult for us to keep on, on top of the, the situation. Um, licensing schemes will typically uh, take two forms. Um, outside of mandatory licensing, you'll have additional licensing, which is only for, for small HMOs, and you'll have selective licensing that covers all uh, private rented property in an area. Um, councils are required to consult, there should be a 10 week consultation period. Um, there are a limited number of grounds that they can use to introduce selective licensing. They have more leeway with HMO licensing. Um, so be aware, stay vigilant. If your local authority 
um, has an email alert system for landlords or has a private rented sector housing team or landlord forum sign up for that. Check the RLA's local authority network pages. We, we keep on top of licensing consultations and licensing schemes. Uh, we, we also um, are prepared to challenge local authorities on licensing conditions, for example. We recently supported landlords in Hindburn with a successful court case over some of the conditions there. So it is, do stay in touch with your local authority. Um, sign up for any emails, listings that they have, attend local forums if they hold local forums, uh, read your e-news that comes out from the RLA, we will highlight consultations and when new licensing schemes are coming in. Let us know if you know about a licensing scheme because sometimes they'll, they'll fall through the cracks, maybe a, a local authority will only advertise it in a local newspaper for example. Um, so if you are aware of a consultation in your area, do let us know, it's really important. Uh, but read your e-news, check our local authority network site and do stay in touch with your local council. Because again, um, you know, you can face uh, civil penalties and rent repayment orders uh, if you're not licensed when you should be. And it's worth pointing out as well that it's not just about the selective licensing schemes that local authorities can introduce, but also several local authorities are now bringing in Article 4 directions. Um, which restricts the change of use of a property from a single dwelling to a, a multi-let. So particularly in areas where there's high density of students. Um, but have we not recently seen one locally that was almost for a warning? Uh, Trafford uh, Council have introduced an emergency uh, Article 4 direction, which is really unusual. Um, when it comes to private uh, rented properties and HMOs. Um, usually there's, there's a consultation process again that's gone through and it's difficult to see under what circumstances a council could justify the need for emergency Article 4 direction uh, restricting uh, planning and, and development rights in houses of multiple occupation. But Trafford Council have done it. They will have to, in six months' time, uh, go through the consultation process if they want it to remain in place. But, uh, but an emergency Article 4 direction can be done without consultation, can be introduced immediately, um, and Trafford Council have done that. Um, we're a bit of a loss to understand where the pressure is in, in Trafford in terms of HMOs. It's uh, not exactly city centre and under pressure. Um, I'm not aware that there's been a, a rush to HMOs and altering Hale. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thanks, Carrie and Janet. And if anybody else has any more questions, then you can feel free to comment on the Facebook post or tweet us at RLA News. Thanks very much for the questions, Vicky. Okay. Thanks very much for your input, Thank Harry. you. And I'm sure we'll, our members look forward to attending a training course near them soon. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. And I know we'll welcome back our Chief Executive, Andrew Goodacre, who will give us some news about some of the exciting developments that the RLA is working on in terms of the services for members uh, and some of the work we're doing in your behalf. Andrew. Hi, thanks again, John. And uh, yes, yeah, the final stretch now, so uh, not much, not much further to go. Um, yeah, the RLA will need to change. John and Carrie have painted, in many ways, a perfect storm of of regulatory changes uh, affecting the sector now. And we didn't even mention tax. We didn't even mention tax <laughs> in all of that, which I'm sure is at top of many a landlord's agenda. We haven't forgotten it. We're still campaigning in that area as well. But we recognise the need to change. The logo is just the start of that. You, many of you will see the latest magazine, which is also um, revised, new, different looking, far better read based on the feedback we've already received. Please read it. Please, you will find something in there that will be of interest to you and relevant to you. Um, and it's really important we do that. Communicating information to landlords is such a difficult task. Um, 10 years ago, uh, I mean, probably 11 years almost now, deposit protection rules were brought in. It's still one of our top five queries for landlords on our advice line. 11 years is taken for people to understand they need to, de de uh, need to protect a deposit um, and do it properly. And yet it's still an issue. We will invest more, we will work harder to get the information to our members and to landlords in general so that you don't fall into those pitfalls. And a lot of our strategy will go towards that. When I think about what the RLA does, and I try to explain it, it comes down to five things. We advise, we inform, we educate, we, we protect and we represent. The rep representational side is headed by John and, and, the, and uh, the policy team and we are putting more resources into that in terms of people and, and using social media smarter to get your voice heard. 
In terms of advice, we've invested recently in live chat and we continue to invest in technology so it's easier for you people to speak to advisors and get the information you need. In terms of education, we've grown our training um, in the last five years incredibly well. We want to continue that by creating, and we just invested in a new platform for our e-learning, which, which will provide more courses, easier to access, and more readily available to you uh, as landlords, so you can do it at your own comfort in a training course, while still offering many, many classroom courses as well. And the protection comes from making sure that we provide the sort of services that you need in the future, um, and, and giving you um, the, the support and help you need to, to to be a successful landlord, to be a good landlord, and to re truly represent the sector for what it is. We know, because the statistics tell us, that 87% of tenants are very happy with their landlord. And we know that you work hard to, to be part of that very high statistic. And we want to carry on with that and, and make, giving you every chance of doing so. In the immediate future, to further enhance the, the, the communication and information out to landlords, we've got a conference in Manchester an exciting venue, the Concord um, venue, in exhibition venue in at Manchester Airport. And this is we're looking at the future of renting. It's on the 25th of April. Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Manchester, the Metropolitan Mayor is there as a guest speaker. And I urge you all to visit the website and book your tickets if you can get to it because it will be a, a really good event. We did something similar in Cardiff last November and, and 200, 220 landlords attended and we got fantastic reviews and we want to carry on with that. It's a way of reaching out to people and help them understand the changes that are coming along. The RLA is here to stay. We've been here 20 years, we'll be here for a lot longer, but we can only do that, we know we can only do it for dynamic, creative and bold with our decision making. We've been bold with the logo, we hope you like it. We'll be bold with the way that we provide the support you need and we'll continue to make sure that we are um, relevant, accessible and go an extra mile on behalf of, of you as, as landlords in the private rented sector. Yeah, Thank I think, you. I think it's important to remember, Andrew, as well, we do need your input if we're going to continue to be successful. Um, yeah, in fairness, um, we, we absolutely only work on, on feedback from, from landlords. We don't want to second guess what you need. Um, the board of directors um, are 11 strong, seven of those guys are, are, are landlords. Um, Carrie, you, you've heard from today, is a landlord and an agent, um, so sees um, many aspects of the sector. Recently we've sent out a survey asking you what you think of us as, as an association, what we do for you, how we do it, and it's really important that you tell us what you want from us and then what we, what we can do better. We do value that feedback, it, 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 we do um, read it, we do try to build future strategies on it and you'll see positive changes as a result. So please um, tell us what you need, whether it's in the survey, whether it's feedback on, on a forum or whether it's using the, the social media, which I'm just getting to grips with. I've now got a Twitter account, remarkably. Um, but you can, uh, you can contact us in many, many ways and we do listen. Yeah, and your experiences are also key to the work we do in forming government uh, and with the media as well. So please participate in our research when the, the RLA peril surveys come out. But also, if you've had a, a particular problem or a particular issue that you feel could be shared with other landlords or um, could be used as an example either in the media or, or with a government department that highlights uh, perhaps some of the difficulties with universal credit or some of the issues with the Section 8 or Section 21 possession processes, then, then get in touch, drop us an email or pick up the phone. We can work with you to, to, to write up that experience and just add real life to some of the statistics and some of the reports that we produce. It's really important to to um, put personality, if you like, into some of the, the campaigning work that we do, and we can only do that if you tell us about your experiences. Yeah, totally agree, and uh, we look forward to being inundated now uh, with the information from you. Um, but uh, yeah, great, and I think with that, we need to move on to a, a small ceremony. Yeah, I think. Uh, which is uh, a cutting of a cake, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, very similar to one on the front of the magazine, um, as you notice. So, let's go on. We've really enjoyed uh, a, live a live broadcast like this. We've never done it before. It's been bold, we've been brave, we've been very nervous building up to this. But hopefully you've enjoyed it, hopefully you found it useful. We're very proud of what we've done for 20 years and we want to make sure 
that we can continue with that pride and continue to make you proud of us as well. So thank you very much for your support. One thing I forgot to mention, when I look into history, to join us in 1998 costs you 75 pounds. To join us in, 19, in 2018 costs you 79 pound 95. Not bad value and will always work to give you the best value, uh, whether it's in terms of membership and the work we do for you. So thank you and here's to the next 20 years. <laughs>